It's 3.31, so I'll call the meeting uh, to the body council to order. Welcome to everybody. It's uh, good to see everybody in person. This is the fourth meeting of the 21-22 school year, and the first meeting we've had in person in over two years. The last meeting we had in person was <laughs> uh, January 2019, which seems like uh, forever ago and yesterday at the same time. You know, so we've uh, accomplished quite a bit in a very you know, difficult situation and being virtual, but I appreciate you guys being here today. So we're going to go ahead and jump to our agenda. Uh, the first item is to consider the approval of the minutes from the February 28th meeting. And our uh, Shack parent co-chair, Misty Westover, will be at this time. Um, update on Proclamation 2022, District <clears throat> Instructional Material Selection Committee Final Review and Recommendation. Mr. Haymark shared the results of the teacher evaluation of the health and physical education instructional materials. Purchase proposal information for Texas Health Skills for Middle School, Texas Health Skills for High School, and Texas Fitness and Wellness Skills were shared, was shared and explained. House Bill 1525 and Senate Bill 9 were reviewed, and Mr. Haymark explained how the opt-in requirements of both legislative bills have been removed from the main text by Goodhart Wilcox and have been released as a companion text to the middle school and high school health textbooks. The chapters and topics within the companion text were shared with the shack. A copy of the current CISD parent consent form opt-in was shared. Mr. Haymark provided information about the shack approved video for human growth and development currently shown to fifth and sixth graders. Information about catch, health, and physical education for elementary instruction was reviewed. Mr. Hamark discussed that the CISD Board of Trustees will consider the SHAC's recommendation at the next board meeting and that the IMA committee will meet to discuss the approval of purchases. Dr. Hines provided an explanation of the IMA Instructional Materials Allotment Committee. Candace Franklin asked about the parent review of materials. Mr. Hamer explained that only one parent commented on the instructional materials under review and that the comments were not specific to any of the materials under review. Bryce Spear commented on the limited choices parents have in regard to this adoption. Dr. Hines explained that the State Board of Education approved only one resource for school districts to consider for adoption. Anna Lamy expressed concern over students taking the health required course for graduation late into their high school career and not receiving health instruction earlier. Mr. Haymark explained that health peaks are written for all grade levels. Dr. Hines explained that the health one course was predominantly for ninth graders, but due to scheduling concerns, the class is now offered to eighth graders for high school credit. Dr. Povich explained that the majority of high school students take the Health One course early to allow room for senior courses. Um, approval of the SHAC recommendation. Approval of the SHAC recommendation to the Conroe ISD Board of Trustees, their consideration of the Good Heart Wilcox instructional materials for middle, middle school health, high school health, and fitness and wellness skills. Motion, Barbara Robertson, second, Candace Franklin. Motion passed. 12 in favor, two opposed. All right, so this time I'll call for a motion to approve the minutes from the February 28th chat meeting. Do I have a motion? Do I have a second? All right, any discussion? All right, there's no chat feature now. So by show of hands, all in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. The minutes in favor of 20th shot meeting are approved. That's chipped in red. All right. Next item on the agenda is the PE and health instructional materials update. So this, I know guys, it's been a lot of work and you guys probably get tired of hearing me talk about it. Um, but today might be one of the last overviews because we've, we've come a long way with the uh, instructional process. So the most recent update, the SHAC's recommendation for the adoption of the Goodhart Wilcox instructional materials for health and physical education was approved by the board of trustees at the March 22nd school board meeting. Instructional material allotment, the IMA committee that we discussed in the last meeting. Uh, the approval for the purchase of instructional materials took place on April 4th. At this meeting, approval was also granted for the purchase of the CATCH programs instructional uh, support for our elementary health and physical education curriculum and for the intermediate and junior high coordinated approach to student health. So that being said, guys, uh, thank you all for your participation in this. It was a very uh, important uh, uh, 
uh, adoption process to continue to support uh, PE programs and health programs. The district is, is uh, appreciated by the coaches and the teachers. You know, uh, doing all this virtually was a tough task, you know, and we had people literally uh, come uh, zooming in in the car rider line, picking the kids up from school. They were on their lunch break. They were uh, in the doctor's office waiting in the waiting room or on the way to doctor's appointments, you know. So that just shows a level of commitment that this group has had to this adoption process. And I really appreciate it. Each and every one of them. All right, next item on the agenda is the SHAC vision, mission, and bylaws update. Again, Mrs. Westover. Thank you. Um, it's really nice to see everybody and put some faces to all the names. Um, so in an effort to get our website a little more up to date and transparent um, so people can take a look and see what we're doing, we wanted to create some content for that. Um, so I've got together with us. Uh -oh. I got together with uh, Samantha Torek, and I don't think she's here today, but um, I do want to thank her for jumping right in. Thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, helping to um, put this all together. So the, we, uh, the resources that we use to, to do all this, we look to uh, the chef guide by the Texas Department of Health and Human Services. We looked at the Connor ISD board policy on the function of SHAC. And we really just went online and looked at a bunch of different SHACs across the state and looked at their website and looked at what they were doing, uh, you know, what their bylaws and missions looked like. And that was, that was really interesting <clears throat> to do. We were, that was a great resource. Um, so we, uh, our mission statement that we came up with was uh, the Conroe Independent School District SHAC mission is to serve as a liaison between the community and school district to promote sound school policies and practices that will improve and maintain the health and wellness of its students, faculty, and community members. So uh, we felt like that was a good representation of why we're here. Um, the next thing we did was create a vision statement. All Conroe Independent School District students will reach their full personal, physical, psychological, and academic potential. Um, you know, we, we felt like we hope everything that we do here will contribute to that goal. So that is what we did for that. Um, next was the bylaws. Um, when we looked around at a lot of other districts, you know, some districts have, you know, very minimal stuff in place for their bylaws and other districts have uh, lots and lots of stuff going on. So what we ultimately did was looked at what the CISD board has put in place, um, what their policy is for the function of our SHAC. And we took that and we, uh, we, we put it into this template so that it would work for our bylaws, really so that, you know, when people want to look, um, they can see what's outlined. Um, after we did all that and we organized <coughs> it that way, um, Sam and I did not have any recommendations to add anything at this time. And we didn't take any liberties to change any of the language or anything that the board has put in place or make any recommendations to do that. So everything, um, you know, that I'm going to show you is what the board has put in place for us. Um, it's just organized in a manner that works for the bylaws. Um, so the first article was the name and purpose. Um, you know, it's all pretty self-explanatory that we are the Conroe Independent School District School Health Advisory. Um, and our purpose is to assist the district in ensuring local community values are reflected in the health education instruction. Um, next are the meetings. Um, so the board has put in place, you know, that we will meet at least four times a year. Um, it has that uh, prior to the meeting that there's notice available, um, you know, that the meetings are recorded. Uh, afterwards, um, that the, those minutes are submitted to the district um, and then made available on the website for people to um, 
And all of this information is in, um, when you came in, was handed out in a little um, thing so that you can look at um, uh, the membership. Uh, you know, we are required to point at least five members. Um, the majority um, should be parents and students. Um, and then there was a recommendation, you know, that we have members from, you know, a wide variety of groups. Um, so, you know, teachers, counselors, um, administrators, students, healthcare professionals, the business community, law enforcement, senior citizens, clergy, um, nonprofit local health organizations, and local domestic violence programs. And we felt like that was a really good um, recommendation just to get a well-rounded, uh, you know, sense of community and group of people. Um, for committees, they have in place that we should have a physical activity and fitness planning subcommittee. Um, so we didn't recommend anything else in terms of committees. Uh, next is the communication. So there, that's in two parts. So there's communication that, you know, the shack is required to submit to the board, um, you know, regarding what our recommendations are. Um, you know, anything that we would want to be modified, or, uh, you know, anything that's changed, uh, a detailed explanation of the SHAC's activities during the period between the date of the current report and the date of the last written report. Um, so that is all stuff that is required for us to submit to the board. And the next part is you actually get your <coughs> own very own page in that pamphlet to look <laughs> over this because it is a lot of information. But this is what the board has in place uh, in terms of, you know, uh, for us to provide to the public. Um, you know, and it's, and it's really all for the sake of transparency and um, to make sure that the parents, you know, know, um, you know, things like, I didn't realize until I read this, that parents can request in writing their child's physical fitness assessment results at the end of the school year. So um, all of it, I think, is just really good information. And, and again, I think organizing like this and putting it on our website just helps, um, you know, for parents or anybody in the community to look to see what we do and the guidelines that we follow. So that is everything that I put together. I have never created a slideshow prior to this. So I had to <laughs> naturally, I had to go get my teenage daughters <laughs> and have them teach me how to do this. They're in the academy over at Conroe. So I can assure you that Mr. <laughs> Kelly is doing good things over there. <laughs> When I got done and I showed it to them um, to get their approval, they told me that everything looked fine, but it was really boring. <laughs> My apologies. I didn't know how to make the bylaws more entertaining, but that is everything that we organized and put together. And that's a tremendous amount of work. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. Thank you. Jess, yeah, thank you, Ms. Westcott, for doing that. Uh, you know, and again, the, the we had this conversation about this earlier in the year. It's, it's, uh, you know, a lot of this information is found you know, on board policy, but we have a difficult time locating board policy. You know? And so we get lots of calls about how do I become part of the shack? What's the about? What are you guys doing as a parent? I want so we figured, you know, have this work done and have it in place like on the shack website where it's accessible to everybody and can see. Because we do want to encourage uh, parents to get involved, community members to get involved, because this is you know, a huge part of this process for everything we do. And so this is a huge, uh, a very important piece of that. And uh, you did a wonderful job. Thank you so much for doing that. Does anybody have any questions or anything you want to add right now at this time? Or suggestions? I mean, so that's why I kind of gave you the old college transfer, you know, the old the three lines on the outside of the thing that you're going to take some note. But what we're going to do in June is we're going to kind of review it again and we will uh, vote on it and have it in place. And then we will post by the year. Also, the end of the year, uh, that happens every year in the June or July. Uh, do a summary report for the board, and that goes for the board. They approve that every year. And the membership will also be approved that time as well. If you did that. Again, another reason why we want to have this posted to the public. Any questions? All right. Thank you so much. All right. On uh, the next agenda item is OPO Debuts with Captain Matt Blakelock. Captain Blakelock has uh, agreed to join us today. You know, Captain Blakelock is a member of our School of Advisory Council. You know, and we're so glad to have him. You know, every single day, a lot of us hear about you know the works of our Connor IC Police Department administrators, people in the district. You know, and they do it without looking for recognition. You know, uh, and they keep our kids' safety 
That's, that's, that's priority for them. But they also <coughs> mentor kids, they, they teach kids, they train kids, and they provide presentation for them. And this is an example of the Conroe IC Police Partners being a part of our community. And uh, we appreciate you. Got Captain White for being here with us today. It's all yours. Wait, thank you very much. And thank you for having me today. <clears throat> I want to talk about opioid abuse. Um, nationally, this is an epidemic. In our country, more people will die from drug overdose than motor vehicle crashes. Um, and particularly opioid abuse, because it's such a dangerous um, set of drugs. And it, it affects us nationally, it affects our state, and it's even in our community. Now, I'm, I'm very happy as I put on this presentation today to be able to tell you that it's almost non-existent within our school district. But it's important nonetheless because if it's in our community, if parents have medicine chests at home, then it could be found in our schools. And some of these drugs are just so very dangerous that it, it's worthy of our attention to make sure that, that we pay attention to this epidemic. So the crisis, what is the crisis? Yeah. In 2019, almost 50,000 people in the United States died from an opioid involved drug overdose. Um, it's a serious national crisis and it affects our public health as well as our social and our economic welfare. The CDC said that they estimate that the economic burden is $78.5 billion a year. And that covers things like uh, criminal justice involvement, which is very costly, healthcare, extremely costly, uh, lost productivity and treatment for addiction. How did this all come about? As pharmaceutical companies developed, uh, we're called painkillers, opioid-based drugs, uh, in the 1990s, they worked really hard to reassure the medical community that patients would not become addicted to these, uh, and they were safe to prescribe. And doctors in our country began prescribing these at a much higher rate. And almost immediately, we started to see abuse, addiction, and overdose rates increase. 2019, it was exactly 49,860 Americans died from opioid-related overdose. 1.7 million people suffered from substance abuse disorders related to opioid pain relievers. And 652,000 people suffered from heroin use disorder, which is not mutually exclusive. Um, often people will begin abusing one drug and it leads to other drugs for various reasons. So what are opioids? Uh, it's derived from the opium poppy plant. Um, opioids are designed to work in the brain and most often for pain relief. They can also be used as uh, cough suppressors, but they work very fast and they're very strong. Uh, they're commonly referred to as painkillers and some are natural, um, like codeine, morphine, those are natural. And then you've got some synthetic like fentanyl and, and some others. Some are legal and some are not. So, Common prescription opioids that, that I'm sure you've heard of many of these, codeine, Vicodin, uh, Lorset, Methadone, Percocet, uh, all of these are common prescription opioids, and there's a lot of them out there. Fentanyl, fentanyl is of key interest because it is 50 to 100 times more powerful than morphine. Some commonly abused illegal opioids would be heroin, uh, desomorphine, which is known as crocodile. Um, that has not been seen as much in the United States as it has in some European countries, but that is a particularly heinous drug. Uh, people that, that begin abusing desomorphine are expected to live about one to two years once they become addicted. Uh, it also has horrible side effects where um, their flesh decays in places where they might inject it. It's just a horrible, horrible drug. Carfentanil is another big one that's, that is seen in the United States. Carfentanil is a Schedule II drug. It's an analog of fentanyl. So analog means it, it shares a similar chemical composition, but it's not quite the same. Carfentanil is designed to sedate elephants and other large animals, and it's not prescribed or used for human use legally. And then, of course, opium. Your most commonly used opioids uh, are your prescription, your Oxycontin, your Vicodin. Um, in the 1990s, you saw a huge spike in um, opioid use disorder based on these prescription drugs. 
You have heroin, which is an illegal drug, which is often a transition drug. People will start on the, on the prescription opioids, they abuse those, and they move to heroin. Uh, 2010, there was a huge spike in heroin overdose in the United States. And then you've got fentanyl, which, as I said, is 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Around 2013, this really took on, and the overdoses just skyrocketed um, in the United States. And overdose on fentanyl, overdose on opioids, often leads to death without immediate medical care. Effects of opioids, they're, they're a very powerful pain relief. Uh, they can be used as a cough suppressor, and they may give, you know, if someone introduces this drug into their body faster and it gets to their brain faster, uh, it can create a euphoric high, which, which often people are looking for. Um, you can ingest it, you can inhale it, you can um, inject it, and those people will often move towards um, snorting crushed up pills or injecting these to get that to their brain faster and get that high that they're looking for. And opioids are very pervasive in that um, they, they trick the brain and the body into convincing that it needs it. It needs it to survive, um, not just to feel well, but to survive. So some risks of regular use, uh, increased tolerance and dependence, um, addiction, which is called opioid use disorder, uh, chasing the high. Uh, higher doses may restrict the ability to breathe. It, it is not uncommon for somebody who has... Uh, taken in uh, an opioid, overdosed on opioids to have 12 respirations a minute. So 12 breaths a minute. Um, think about how much you, how many times you breathe in a minute normally, and that's frightening. Um, <clears throat> opioids will block receptors. If you, if you have too much of that in your system, your body has opioid receptors. And if you put too much of this into your system, it will, in essence, make your body start shutting down and organs will shut down Obviously, your respiration slow down, and it can stop the heart. Um, when misused, it may lead to fatal overdose, and there are many synthetic opioids that are manufactured illegally. We call them gar garage labs or uh, bathtub labs, where people decide the, the criminal route. They want to make this drug and um, self-fund themselves, and so they make it, and it's not in any way, shape, or form regulated, and there's no telling what can be in it. In the last several years, um, it's been found that a lot of your illicit drug um, manufacturers are, they will make something and they will lace it with fentanyl. And the buyer doesn't know that. And they don't realize that it's quite as dangerous um, as what they're already planning to take. Some signs uh, of the use and abuse, which is what we really focus with our community on. And when we talk to kids, we talk to parents, we want them to know the signs because if they see somebody that can tell uh, we want them to get help. So there's inability to control the opioid use. They Once they, they become addicted, they've got to continue to use to function and to be normal. Uh, uncontrollable cravings, uh, drowsiness, a change in their sleep habits, weight loss, uh, frequent flu-like symptoms, <clears throat> their depressed breathing, lack of hygiene, um, their exercise habits change dramatically. Uh, they isolate from their family and friends. Um, they steal, they have new financial difficulties because they're spending all of their money on getting the drug as opposed to paying their bills and taking care of their responsibilities. Uh, and then one of the, the, the medical things you'll see is pinpoint pupils. So that's just a good mix of, of the things that you'll see that may not necessarily indicate opioid, but it could uh, indicate opioid abuse. So nationally, roughly 21 to 29 percent of the patients that are prescribed opioids for chronic pain will misuse them. That's frightening. Um, between 8 to 12 percent that are using prescription opioids will develop that opioid use disorder. Four to six percent misusing these prescription opioids will transition to heroin. Um, as their body develops the tolerance to the drug, they need something stronger, something faster, and, and often leads to the illicit drugs like heroin. About 80% of the people who use heroin uh, first misused prescription opioids. <clears throat> and in 2018, uh, there were 46,802 overdose deaths, nearly 70% of all of the overdose, overdose deaths in the country. In Texas, uh, the picture is not quite so grim. Um, I, I am happy to say that in our state, uh, and I'm, I apologize for that graphic being so small, but the, the lighter the color, the less of a problem. So 
in Texas, for instance, we have less than 6.2 deaths per 100,000 people. Um, and that is the lower end of the scale. Uh, when you see Kentucky, Alaska, Virginia, you're going to see higher numbers in, in several of those states. Uh, the problem is we have, I think, around 29, 29 million people in Texas, and that could still be 1,800 people dying from it each year, um, which is frightening. You'll see that uh, and this is Texas in particular. Um, we have a decrease in the prescription opioids. And I think that stands to reason because as people have come to realize how dangerous the prescription drugs are, doctors have started to prescribe them less and less. And there's more public education and there's more ability for people to not abuse them. Um, heroin has increased and very frightening. Uh, and synthetic opioids, um, they are the lowest right now. They've leveled out over the last few years in Texas, but they are by far the most dangerous because the people that are using synthetic opioids are getting them illegally and they never know what is in them. Any given day, 78 people are going to die from an opioid related overdose. Um, 3,900 people will use prescription opioid outside of legitimate purpose. Uh, 580 people will try heroin for the first time every day. Um, heroin overdoses have skyrocketed in the last 10 years. Um, it's an average age of 24 and a half years old for first time users of heroin. Counterfeit painkillers uh, are laced with heroin, fentanyl, and other fentanyl derivatives um, are highly prevalent out there and causing people to die in record numbers. Um, ingestion, inhalation, or skin absorption of two milligrams of fentanyl. And fentanyl is the big, the big one people are talking about. Can, be, can kill a person. And so if you picture one of the sweetener packets on the restaurant table, that's about a thousand milligrams. Two milligrams can kill a person. What can we do about it? Um, first, we can reject the notion that it can't happen to me or my family or someone that I care about. Uh, we can have meaningful conversations with family members and friends, uh, participate in public education events on drug abuse, <clears throat> speak up, call law enforcement, if you ever have information about um, drug use or abuse uh, or sales, um, lock up your prescription drugs in your house and take advantage of the national drug, uh, local drug take back days. Uh, at least once a year, the, the federal government has a, a national uh, take back drugs day. We set up a station at the police department and people can come, no questions asked, they drop their prescription drugs. They, whatever it is they drop in there, we dispose of properly. Um, and if it gets it out of the house, then kids are less likely to be able to get their hands on it. And with that, I'll, I'll open it up to any questions. I am not a medical expert. Um, let me just make that note now, but I'm happy to answer any questions anybody might have. We'll put a plug in for the drop off of medicine. It's a, it's a fantastic program. I've taken advantage of that myself um, when we needed to dispose of some family medicines. And I, thankfully it's offered uh, nationally and locally. Huge program, very good about getting those illicit drugs out of our community. I'll tell you another thing too, just kind of about that the field. They, the FDA, a lot of different organizations, different boards of medicine and stuff like that are also restricting you can't just walk in and have a pad, a prescription pad out anymore. It all is ran electronically. They're keeping track of it before any doctor can prescribe any of those level drugs. They have to go back and look in the system and see. They have to log in, look on their computer and see how many times has this person been prescribed. It can be looked at across all courts, not just, I'm in the dental field, so not just dentally. We can look at, oh, well, the orthopedic surgeon just gave them 20 pills last week, and oh, wow, well, they went to Walgreens and filled a prescription from this doctor the week before. And so then you base that off that because every pill given out comes back to that provider. Absolutely. And then we've had surgical patients that their pharmacy will not fill, even after having extractions or, you know, all on board ventures or anything like that, will not fill the game pills. We're like, no, 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 that patient needs that. We're going to have pain in 12 hours. And so all of that plays a factor, but that's why it's so much harder to get a hold of some of these prescriptions. If there is any way for a person to abuse the system uh, by doctor shopping, 
by stealing a prescription pad, by uh, bribing or paying someone to to uh, falsify a prescription, they're going to do it if they feel like they've got to have that drug. And those controls and measures are huge towards towards limiting the problem. Yeah, it's getting harder and harder for them to get even the needed prescription. So. Yep. There's no more questions. Thank you for your time. All right. Yeah, but, well, thank you so much. That was an excellent presentation. Very powerful, very eye opening for me. In a lot of ways, the us those statistics were pretty incredible. Thank you so much. All right, the next item is future topics and meeting dates. Uh, we're going to continue the discussion about our vision, mission, and bylaws at, at the next meeting. Uh, I'll provide an overview of the annual school health survey for our district as well. Uh, the next meeting is scheduled for June 14th at 3 30 p.m. It is scheduled to be a Zoom because of the summer uh, schedule, but that's something to change. So, you know, I know everybody's kind of busy this summer time, but we'll kind of assess that. But as of now, it's a Zoom meeting. If the format changes, I will let you know in advance of the meeting. Uh, before we uh, adjourn, Dr. Hines, do you want to address the group for anything? No, I just want to say thank you for being here. I know we're very busy this time of year. We're here for the spring. Thanks, Dr. Hines. All right, with that, the time is now 4.02. And this meeting of the School of Advisory Council stands adjourned. All right, guys, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it.